and, and, and understand more about, I, I want to take some time now and just even kind of go back over some understanding about the four fields, five parts, abiding with Christ. Um, I, I want to, if I can, let me just remember this. I you have got the four fields, the five parts. You know, you've got an empty field, you're going into it. Whether you're going cold turkey or whether you're really being it, you know, systematic with your oikos, or whether you're um y'all did something um like setting up pizza. Yeah, pizza in a question. All right, pizza in a question, but an event with an intent. Don't just have events. But have events with intents in which you know you're going into an area and you are actually going to share the gospel. And I, I'm just, I'm a stickler. Maybe I'm a legalist, but I just think go ahead and draw it. Draw it out and leave it with them. And, and then when you start seeing people respond, you're going to help them grow first with baptism. <clears throat> and, and then you're going to start gathering the people. And then because the, the job is so big, you've got to recruit others, even brand new Christians. Like Lloyd, you know, he, uh, he received Christ, and I asked him, I said, okay, give me one or two. This is like seconds after he told me. He said, yeah, I put my faith in Jesus. I go, okay, Lloyd, you know, give me one or two words that would describe you before you had this decision to make the Father Jesus as your Savior. And he gave me two words. I said, now how do you feel? Now I'm like, I feel peaceful. I said, that's your story. You can go back to your, your Muslim friends and you can say, you know, there was a time in your life when, when you were anxious and worried and fearful and, shame, and felt shame. But now that you put your faith in Jesus, you're at peace. You've got a story and no one can take that from you. But that was something, again, right away. And they, they notice, I mean, it might not be as clear, but I asked him more, how do you feel now? But get to understand this, because... All right, that's a little better heart than I did the last night, right? It's all about God's heart. And the four chambers of God's heart. Our heart has four chambers. And, and I, I want us to look at Mark chapter 1, 9 through 39. And there, really there are six parts. Even though last night we emphasized four fields, five parts, there are really six aspects of this. Because if we're fighting, there's a fighting, and then we'll be going, there will be gospeling, There will be helping others grow. And then you will see some gathering. And then the whole guy. And, and the, the, write down the verse Psalm 78 72. I guess I need to add one. Yeah. Psalm 78, 72 needs to be turned on. And can someone read that out loud? And really, I want you to think, what were the two ingredients or the two, I guess, foundations for why God chose David to be a shepherd? Somebody read it out loud. And, and then, what does it say? Psalm 78, verse 72. He shepherded them with a pure heart and guided them with a skillful hand. All right, so what were the two things God chose David to be his shepherd of his people because of two things? What were they? Upright heart. Upright heart. Skillful hands. Skillful hands. It's a come or integrity of heart. I think the American uh, standard says that. Integrity of heart, skillful hands. It's going to take skill. It's going to take integrity. Now, again, we, 
we may not, I mean, the, the woman of the well, she didn't have a lot of integrity, but she had enough integrity with the Lord to go back. She didn't really feel qualified, but, I mean, you know, she went back to the men. She went back to the people. I know the NIV says people. NAS says men. Can you imagine the person that was, the group of people that were making fun of you, probably making you the brunt of their jokes? And she's going back to them? That was integrity with God. But integrity of heart. That's why the inviting part is so important. And then the skills, having simple, biblical, reproducible skills that can easily be passed on to others. I used to be able to share the gospel for over an hour and 15 minutes with 53 verses. And people would actually listen. This was back in the day when people's attendance stands, attention stands were a lot longer. Uh, that was a long time ago. But, uh, but again, that's not, it was not, well, not reproducible. It's good, solid, but simple, biblical, reproducible skills, tools. But I want us to understand, and all of understand is how does this all fit in so I want you to take the time at your table to start in verse 9 of chapter 1 of Mark and just start looking at verses and please put the verse along with the action or the point. And, and, and I want you to put up what, what reflects abiding, what reflects going, gospel, grow, gather, guide. Okay? And let's do that for about 10 minutes. All right? So work fast with each other and look at those things. All right? Go. All right. Let's think about this as far as just the, the binding, the integrity of heart, you know, and skillful hands. But um, let's just start at the very beginning. And maybe you know, what were the things that began to click in your mind about abiding? The Spirit. The Spirit. What do you mean? Give me a verse. Okay. Gotta give me a verse. When he went out to the, uh, the wilderness, the Spirit uh, immediately drove him out to the wilderness. Um, you see him like abiding in the Spirit. Like the Spirit, like, he didn't just... like. Whatever. And what verse? Specific okay. verse. Specific verses. Specifically verse 12. Verse 12. Yeah, led by the Spirit. He's abiding. He's abiding. All right, but right here before that, what do you see? Holy Spirit came upon him, verse 10. Holy Spirit came upon him, verse 10. His Father says, I love you. Yeah, his Father said, I love you. What verse? 11. 11. Anything else? Baptized, Yeah, he's identified. He's embracing his identity. You know, the new thing about Shay, the guy I was telling you about, Catholic background, I don't know about you, but when you have a talk with a Catholic, usually they resist baptism. But, you know, we talked about how Jesus, when he was a child, was, you know, dedicated. But when he was an adult, he embraced baptism. And that, you know, Shay said, yeah, that's, I need to do that. But he was embracing, he's abiding, he's obeying. That's verse 9. Yeah, you know. So yeah, we're kind of going back a little bit. Yeah, so yeah. Just going into that. Okay, let's let's kind of keep going a little bit. Verse um, 14. Jesus went into Galilee. That's the going. He's proclaiming the good news of God. That's the, the gospel. He's going forth in uh, verse, um, you can kind of get verse 16. He goes back to go. He not only went to Galilee, he went by, walked beside the Sea of Galilee. And then specifically, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting, net, um, casting nets. Come follow me and I will make you uh, fishes of men. That's kind of discipleship or growing, right? That's verse uh, 17.
You could say 16 through 20 is all about recruiting, casting vision, because he also recruited um, you know, uh, you know, the whole thought of sending you out among people. And then uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. You can even so verse 14, you can go back to abiding because he, he's abiding and preaching the gospel. He's doing what God has asked him to do. See, sometimes we have this idea of abiding is I go up and get alone with Jesus and I, that's a good thing to do. But it is a blend of doing, if I am in the will of God, if I'm in the spirit of God, then I am doing what he is asking me to do. I am with Jesus. And Jesus, he, he's, he's in the will of God. He's doing what God has asked him to do. He's making disciples. That's still part of abiding. Verse 16. When you hit verse 21, what's stuck out to you? Twenty-one. He's working on the Sabbath. He's working on the Sabbath. Yeah, that, his idea of Sabbath we might be a little different than some of our ideas of that Sabbath. But it's kind of interesting if you ever study. How did Jesus use his Sabbaths? Going to synagogues. Going to synagogues. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah, he's. But he is a part of teaching. He began to teach. So that's part of the discipleship. Well, he's going to the synagogue and go. Yeah. Verse 21. Yeah, verse 21. I'd say, I'm going too fast. I'm sorry. Also, in verse 21, he went into Capernaum. You see, I mean, he, he's going, and as he's going, he's proclaiming, you know, it, it's. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Is no. That right? No. Yeah. G-O-G-U-E. Oh, wow. Is that teaching their gospel or is growing? Yeah, I, I, I make a distinction. You may, I mean, I, you know, it depends. But I'm looking at when I see the word teaching, I'm seeing that's growing. When I hear the word proclaiming or preaching, that's gospel. So the distinction here is probably teaching believers? Or God fears, but he, I mean, he's kind of a growing start stage. He's yeah. in the growing stage because again, a lot of the idea of you know you, you start discipling someone bef um, at the coffee shops. You start discipling people in the garages. You start discipling people in in your house. So okay, does that make yeah, yeah, that's good, yeah. it fits? All right. Um, that right? Verse yeah, teaching. That's growing. 22. Teaching with authority. Where would you put that? We already had teaching here, but the whole thought of authority. <coughs> I think abiding. I think abiding. Because again, he's in tune with the spirit, you know, and he's a teacher with authority, identity. And then he's running into some impure spirits. Gotta ask, how many of y'all finished reading Restored? Anybody not finished reading it yet? I haven't even finished reading it yet. I know we're supposed to read it by then, but I, for, sorry. Our, our internet, I, um, I was expecting to read it all the way up, but it's, we lost internet. No so, but, um, no excuse. Yeah, yeah, no excuse, I know. Uh, I'm in sin. If you haven't um, read it, keep reading so, it. I have no authority, goodbye. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, you know, that's, that's part of abiding, but also it's a, it's a part of just, you know, understand the spiritual warfare. He's, he's modeling spiritual warfare with the, the disciples there. That's verse 25 or 24 and 25. You know, isn't it interesting that someone with an impure spirit knows the theology of Jesus? Did y'all catch that? Someone who is influenced by impure spirits, demonic powers, they probably know the theology and deity of Jesus better than some Christians. 
I will. I will. Too, Bert, he, in the synagogue, you noted know, it points out he's teaching in the synagogue on yes. the Sabbath. And then after he teaches, someone in the synagogue with an unclean spirit came. I just, of all the places, if you're a Jew, to expect an unclean demon. Yeah. In your, it's not right there on Sabbath day when you're having worship service, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, we have this idea. I don't know. I, I, um, years ago, I, I watched the movie The Exorcist. I wouldn't recommend it. But, you know, um, we, we see these TV shows and these movies, and we think if anybody has been being influenced by demons, demons, they're spinning their head around and spitting out green vomit or stuff like that. And, and it probably are there people who have a, they're drawn to the spiritual, but they still have an impure spirit. That's a very good point, Jordan. Realize that. And, but as Jesus is teaching, so again, it's, it, that's part of, you could even say that's part of abiding too. He's in spiritual warfare. And he's doing that, and, and then it goes on, and then um, this is, is um, let's go on to verse 29 for the sake of time here. Um, as soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Do we start seeing church formation? Like Burke, I don't know, you're kind of stretching it out. He's using the word they now. They went there. They went to the home. They're, they're wanting more than just an event. And then people are bringing... What? Peter and Andrew, is that becoming... Yeah, Peter, yeah. Well, Peter's, Simon's mother-in-law was in bed. Um, and, uh, and then verse 31, when she gets healed, she starts waiting on them, on them. There's, a, there's, a, there's now a community being formed. You know, we're not talking about a perfect church. We're talking about church formation. Because, but before a church can be mature, it's got to start, right? So somehow something's happening here because, you know, and then let, let's look at verse 34 and 35. 34, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. So again, he was modeling love. He was modeling spiritual warfare. But what do you see in verse 35? Prayer. Prayer. Where would that be? Abiding. Abiding. Solitude. He's practicing solitude. He's practicing prayer. He's modeling that. And, and uh, so, um, then verse 36 is always is, is an intriguing verse. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone's looking for you. What does Jesus do in verse 38? Builds a mega church. Builds a mega church. Hey, bring it, everybody. Let's have a healing ministry. Yes. Let's do that. He does not do that. I mean, Sergio, how would you feel? I, you know, I'm picking on Sergio. But Sergio, how would you feel if, if you know, you, you got all your friends coming in to be healed and Jesus comes back from prayer time? And what does Jesus do? Does he start healing all your friends? That's revival there. Yeah, but he's, what does Jesus do? No, he's not. <laughs> Verse 38, let us go somewhere else. Ooh. Yeah. And right now, inside. yeah, I mean, ooh, how does that make you feel? But he uses the word let us. That's church formation. That gap. That, that's gap. 36. Because that's when he says, let us go. And what does he say? Go where? Nearby village. Nearby villages. Plural. <clears throat> so he can do what? Preach. So he wanted to go to villages. Plural. He wants to preach. And that's why I come. That's 38. And so then look at verse 39. Did he build a mega church? What does it say? He went throughout Galilee. He went throughout Galilee. Preaching. 
in preaching. I mean, that would, it, I, you know, someone told me that basically in the, uh, the years that Jesus was on the earth after his baptism, he went to 157 towns or villages. And he had a purpose. When, when Jesus was on this earth, God had a body that did exactly what he wanted him to do. And now we're his body. And how are we abiding so that we're going and gospeling and growing and, and gathering and leaving clusters? Now, now, in one sense, all of this is abiding. Okay. It's a two-edged sword. When you're abiding, you will be doing this. Now, you can do this without abiding. A lot of people can have skills. You have numchuck skills. <laughs> other kind of skills. You can have gospel skills. You can have discipleship skills. But if you're not abiding, then it will not multiply. But if you're abiding, you will be doing this. Notice I, I purposely have not addressed anything about in the leadership development. Because basically at this stage, Jesus' leadership development is all about modeling. You're going to learn something. Model, assist, watch, and lead. And at this stage, he was exemplifying what it was to abide with the Father. All of this is modeling. But then later on, he's going to be assisting and then watching and releasing and leading. But I want us to, I want you to just stay, remind, you know, turn the person next to you and remind people just maybe using this passage that we see what it is to abide. As we, as we look at abiding, we also look at the four fields, five parts. And just take some time to, you know, give, you know, talk it through with somebody. Like you are telling somebody this for the first time. You're trying to explain, hey, others may do it differently, but we're going to do it this way. And that's leadership development. What is your plan to take someone who is lost to be a leader, a laborer? We see Jesus' plan as he abided. He went, he entered, he gospeled. Those who responded, he helped grow. And he gathered them with others who were responding. And then he saw the Spirit start guiding them. But take the time to explain Mark 1 of the four fields, five parts, really the six parts of abiding. And just take time right now and we'll go with that. Any questions before I close? Just drop the mic. Okay. 38. I just want to drop there too, Bert. Uh, verse 29, I think it's intentional. It says, uh, immediately Jesus left the synagogue and he entered the house of Simon. Mm -hmm. We've learned that this week already. What's that Greek word for house today? Oikos. 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 Yogurt. Yeah. <laughs> so he enters in verse 29 the Oikos of Simon and Andrew, which I think is even just having gone out for the last what, hour or so. Um, some of these people are going to either be believers or new believers. And you're going to need to start drawing that Oikos map. And the temptation is to say, go. Go to your Oikos, share the gospel with them. Does Jesus just do that with them, though, with Simon? What does he do? Right. Uh, Alexa has done this uh, like two weeks ago. So she led Sanjita to faith in, in Raleigh. And her family is Muslim. And she didn't just say, go share with your dad. She said, hey, we're coming to your home. And so we went into her home a couple weeks ago. And she sat down. We opened the word of God and sat down with Sanjita and do it right there. And I think people need that. When you model for them reaching their Oikos, they're going to be way more fruitful and courageous even moving forward from that as a laborer than just saying, hey, here's a tool. Go, go run with it. Right? Even... The way we go out two by two, I'm guessing somebody probably took the lead, right? Like there's a modeling piece attached to the way that we've gone out this afternoon. Where, man, I might feel a little bit nervous, but I'm, a, I'm, I'm next to uh, to my crew, and, and they're confident. Like Ross is sharing the gospel, and I'm learning from the way that I see him inter interacting with people. And I think Jesus is the master of that. And I look around this room, and I think there's a lot of us growing in that confidence. Some of us would feel like, man, I got this. 
But we need to be people who are constantly bringing somebody along, right? Inviting them in more and more often. And not just to go to strangers, but also to look at their map. And I know it's weird, right? Like, hey, can I come on you know, three hour drive to go visit your family for, for Thanksgiving or something like that? But go with them. Like, how much dignity and value does that give to the ministry they have to their family and friends? When you take out the time in your calendar, your busy calendar, to say, hey, I'm going to go spend an overnight time with you and your family. And we're going to be intentional, right? You can even model when you wake up in the morning what we do as believers when we wake up in the morning, right? Open the word. Mm -hmm. There's just so much there that I think without sleepovers, it's hard to really disciple somebody. Without having that intentional, I'm going to go with you to people that you already love, it's hard to really disciple. And I think that's connected when Jesus at the end is able to say, hey, let's go to the next town. Yeah. It's because he's modeled in this town, what did you know? And there's these seeds. It's not quite maybe exactly what it's going to be one day. Uh, but there is seeds for church. And I think even in Simon's mother, mother-in-law's house, there's a gathering going on right there. And he's able to keep going to the next town and the next town where he can start these seeds over and over. And for some of us, it might be whole cities. But for some of us, it might be, man, just this dorm or this home, this neighborhood, this family, whatever. But we want to keep, keep moving, I think, to be able to model each one of those so that as they grow, Right? There can actually be the seeds of the church where you're leaving behind people who feel confident. Yeah, I can do this. You modeled for me. You've assisted me. I can lead a church in my home with my family. You know, it might be five of us. That's my story. Yeah. About five of us. We're, we're church in my family on Zoom for yeah for, for years. Um, and so yeah, I just I love seeing Jesus imitate. I think, and that's how we're trying to read it. Right? Is imitate Jesus. Whatever we see. Right? This is just one paradigm to help us figure out how to spend time. But whatever he did, even if it's not on the board, do that, right? And uh, but I think a lot of it is captured in, in what we're doing right now. And just to think about this, if he is our master, then his mission is our mission. If he's our master, his mission is our mission. His model is our model. And I agree, you know, with, with Jordan. I, Barbara and I had the privilege of being in Israel on a trip, and we went into Capernaum. And we actually saw the synagogue and a stone's throw away from the synagogue was Peter's house. And it had been excavated to where they said that a church had met there for over 300 years. So yeah, something was started. So that's why he could leave and not feel like he had to be responsible to keep healing people in the city. Because the seeds were left. And so that's what we want to even believe that as we spend um, a couple of weeks with people, that the right tools will be passed on <coughs> so that when we leave, they'll keep it up. They'll keep knowing what it is to abide and to go and to gospel and to grow and to gather. And then eventually the Lord will raise up someone's filled with the Spirit to guide. Can I share one more story? Sure, you want a microphone? Yeah, no, it's okay. All right. Just a quick story, afternoon story time, since we're, you know, keep everybody away. Do it. But, uh, so, so my buddy Ross Bradley, he's got a friend out in Durham who went out, just like we did, went out to strangers. He went knocking on doors in an apartment complex. And the first door he knocks on is a lost guy. So what does he do, right? Shares yes. a 15 second testimony, shares the three circles, he shares the gospel with them. And this guy actually was like a right. He was like, yeah, thank you for sharing this with me. I, I've actually been thinking about this, and I want to follow Jesus. Right there, he led me Christ. And so what did he do after that? You had to guess, what did he do right after that? Yeah, so he could have baptized me. He actually didn't baptize him right here. What else might he have done? should have asked, did he have anything to eat? Yeah. <laughs> Can I come in your fridge? What did he say? <laughs> Can I come? What did he do? Yeah. Yeah, he starts talking about the mission right away. He told him, hey, I'm actually meeting your neighbor, sharing the same story I just shared with you. And uh, you're the first door I knocked on. So he invited him, hey, you want to come with me to the next door? Yeah, I can. Sure, I'll come. And so they go together to the next door, and he knocks on it. This guy, he, had, he really didn't train him. He just took him with him. Come with him. That's training. On, yeah, right? <laughs> Jesus, uh, on the, on the and, job uh, training. He knocks on the yeah. next door, and inside is a guy who's already a Christian. And another good interaction. They talked to him. They had a great conversation. And this guy says, man, I'm so glad you came here. I've actually been thinking about reaching my neighbors. And I've not done anything about it. I'm glad y'all came. 
So what do you guess he did at that point? With that guy? Here, so what he did was he said, hey, look, he, and he introduced us to you guys. Hey, this is your neighbor. I just led him to faith, and you're a believer already. You guys live here and have a heart for this community. And so he actually didn't go with them. You know what he did? What did you say? He sent them. He sent them. Okay, he said, I'm going to leave. And I want you guys to go out and just do what we've been doing. And so what he did from there was he allowed them to go to that community themselves. And he went home. I don't know if he's taking that from that. He kept that relationship. So he kept training them from that, but he used a different environment for training and allowed them to be the team there. And by not going back there, I think what he did was realize, or help them recognize that value. Hey, man, we are the, we're the people of peace here. Like we're the house of peace. And they began to recognize it's not this outsider. But he found us, and now we're ready to go. And so they went after that. So that's just a quick afternoon story time. But I think it's helpful even thinking about, you know, we're not just looking for people receiving the, the, the messenger and the message. Yeah. But all the way to the mission. And those are rare. They really are. But if you had to knock on 20 doors to find one person like that, would you do it? Would you do it if you had to knock on 30 doors? Or 40 doors. Mm -hmm. Is it worth it? Is he worth it? Mm -hmm. And so again, that's why we keep going over Jesus' pattern. He modeled it. And we're following him. And it's breaking the norm. Because yeah, like even Jordan kind of said, yeah, when we start seeing things happen, we want to build a John the Baptist mega church ministry. Rather than low, let's keep training to go out and find and see a multiplication. I gotta share this. I hadn't had been shared yet. All right, let's. Bryson is a super evangelist. He goes out and he sees a thousand people hear about Christ a week. Takes a two week vacation. He's well deserved. But at the end of one year, he's he uh, fifty thousand have heard about Jesus. Because of Bryson. Jordan, he's a multiplier. He goes and he does like Ross. He goes to one and one, you know, you know, kind of gets equipped. And but at the end of one year, fifty thousand have heard, as opposed to two. Who are you impressed with? Bryson. Bryson. The Holy Spirit. Next year comes along. Bryson goes out, tears turkey for another fifty thousand, takes a two-week vacation. But now Jordan and, 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 and Juan, you know, have been able, you know, with, with uh, Christian and Valerie, they, they've come to the Lord. But again, after two years, 100,000 have heard the gospel. But there's just been a training and modeling Jesus' style. Who are you still impressed with? Still Bryson. Do you know how long it will take Bryson to reach 8 billion people? Eighty thousand? I mean, eight thousand years? Eighty thousand years? I don't think he's going to live that long. But if there is the understanding of equipping and training and multiplying and recruiting, you know how long it would just if Jordan was the only one passing on this idea? Forty. Of 33. I think Jordan might have 33 more years to live. <laughs> so you see the importance of not just mounting Jesus, but following him. And really studying him and seeing what he did and how he did it. And being around others who understand what it is to abide and to follow this pattern. Again, it's not just doing the tools. It's learning how to walk in this power of the Spirit and recognize like what Ross, yeah, I, I'd forgotten about Ross Bradley and what that happened. I mean, that's, you know, neat what God's doing. And he's done that with several of you. It really has. But let's keep doing it until there's no place left that hadn't heard about Jesus. All right? Amen? Amen.
All right. So again, I still want you to practice to tell, retelling this like you're going to tell somebody who's not here at Link. You're going to tell them, say, this, this is what we learned. This is what we're doing. Will you come join me? Real quickly, like two minutes each. you got to really speed it through. And then take a break. All right.